and, and I'm with you. But thank you, James, for the Hello, good morning. Good morning if you're in Europe. Nihon no minasama, yokoso. I'm Morgan Benoit, coordinator at the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation. And it is a great pleasure today to welcome you to this EU Japan workshop titled Hydrogen in Transport, Industry and Power Generation. So, this is actually a follow up to our first workshop on green hydrogen production that we had back in May. So if you wanna have a look, it's available on our website. Uh, this event is organized by the EU Japan, for Industri EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation, co-organized with the European Commission Directorate General for Energy and the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan. So let me start with a few technical details. Uh, you can listen to this webinar in English and Japanese. Uh, you can select your language by clicking the interpretation button globe icon on the bottom of your screen. Uh, please note that you need a recent version of Zoom uh, to be able to use this feature. And the recording of this workshop will be available on our website within a few days, as well as the presentation materials. So without further ado, let me introduce our moderator for the day, which is Professor Kazunari Sasaki, who is the Senior Vice President of Kyushu University, Director of the International Research Center for Hydrogen Energy and Next Generation Fuel Cell Research Center. Professor, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for introduction. Can you hear me well? I have the pleasure and honor to serving as today's moderator. I am a Professor Suzuki, a Vice President of uh, Kyushu University, and also the Center, uh, the uh, Director for the International Research Center of the Hydrogen Energy. And uh, there are so many viewers from Japan, so I chose Japanese as my official language. If you would like to listen to the English language, please choose the English button on the simultaneous translation. So thank you very much for taking part in the hydrogen event. I'd like to thank you all for your participation. So this is not going not a face-to-face -face meeting because of the COVID-19. But since this is the webinar, this is a blessing in disguise, you can be connected from any country around the world or in your offices or from your home. We have uh, already 1,400 participants registered. So I'd like to make the session significant and meaningful for all of the 1,400 people who have signed up. 
Uh, so this is simultaneously translated. You can choose either Japanese or English for you to listen to. From Europe, as well as from Japan, we have representatives representing the government sector as well as the industry sector to speak. In response to the Paris Agreement, in Europe, the policies are promoted to achieve carbon neutrality, especially in Europe. Uh, here in Japan as well, Prime Minister Suga uh, declared that Japan will go carbon neutral by 2050. Therefore, since October last year, society at large is accelerating uh, the engagements uh, for the green innovation. I personally, I spent 10 years in Switzerland and Germany concerning the uh, hydrogen research after I came back from Europe to uh, Japan. I have been engaged in research and education on hydrogen energy for the past two decades at Kyushu University, comparing Europe and Japan. Uh, there are unique researches and projects going on in Europe as well as in Japan. So there is the relationship of uh, mutual complementation. Uh, so each has the uh, strength uh, on the one hand in Europe, on the other hand in Japan. So Japan and Europe could be mutually complementary. During this uh, webinar, how could Europe and Japan could work closely together to achieve their global carbon neutra neutrality? So this is the agenda I'd like to think together with you during this uh, two and a half hours of uh, session. I'd like to ask for your kind participation and cooperation. I'd like to move on to the lecture, the initial session. Uh, this is going to be the policy makers from the government authorities from both regions. For the first uh, re lecture concerning the European policy trend uh, from European Commission for Energy DG, Mr. Konstantinex, uh, the floor is yours. Dr. Tudor Konstantinex, would you please? Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to, to be with you here today. And uh, I'm honored to participate in the opening of this second workshop on hydrogen in the context of EU-Japan energy dialogue. I'm, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, recently we also had the EU-Japan Energy Dialogue in July, and uh, in this context, it was agreed to focus on hydrogen as a priority. So this will continue to stay an important area of cooperation between EU and Japan in the field of energy. So also I would like to, to say that uh, the EU and Japan adopted a Green Alliance, and this will uh, help strengthen cooperation on technologies that can play a crucial role in the energy transition. We also acknowledge that METI published in recent weeks a basic energy plan and again the role of hydrogen in this. And we also are happy to say that we are very watching with interest and willing to participate at the highest level at the hydrogen energy ministerial that Japan will organize. So there are a lot of uh, things and as it was said, we are having today a second workshop. The first one was on production. Now it will be on industry, transport, and power production. And we'll uh, look at uh, the progress made in our countries and regions, but also at the possibilities for cooperation. Next slide. I have to say, at European level, the, the driver, as uh, I sure you know by now, it's a European uh, Green Deal. This is one of the most important projects to boost the efficient use of resources by moving to a clean circular economy and to restore biodiversity and, and cut pollution. We know that the energy sector is responsible for 75% of emissions, which is crucial in the, in the Green Deal also to achieve the carbon neutrality we aim for 2050, but also to achieve the more ambitious targets we have now for 2030 where the purpose is to invest more now and to put the economies on a sustainable pathway. And this will help the investments made for the Green Deal and to accelerate the energy transition will also help now economic recovery after the COVID crisis. In the context of the Green Deal, you know, we have come with a number of important initiatives, a more comprehensive look at the energy system, the energy system integration strategy, in which already the role of hydrogen was identified in decarbonizing uh, uh, heavy uh, duty transport and in certain industries. And subsequent, we can even with a hydrogen strategy, which is a roadmap really, and with concrete targets for 20, 
uh, 24 for 2030 on uh, deploying technologies on uh, raising up the production and the demand for renewable hydrogen particles and low carbon hydrogen and making sure they can contribute effectively to the decarbonization of the energy system. We have a target of uh, 40 gigawatts to be installed in Europe of electrolyzers by 2030. And um, I have to say, we see already good progress in this direction because at the same time with the two strategies I have mentioned, we have had launched a EU Hydrogen uh, Clean Alliance, which brings together more than 1,000 stakeholders in Europe and companies, which are now working to develop project pipeline based uh, on concrete projects in all the fields. We see that predominantly our projects in the field of hydrogen production, but also in the use of hydrogen transport and industry. And uh, the focus is very much, I have to say, on, on renewable hydrogen. Now, the first communication was at the forum event in June this year. And now we are analyzing uh, the thousand projects uh, and uh, try to come with a further assessment for this autumn. Uh, next slide, please. It is about the Fit for 55 package. And here I have to say over the last month, in particular in July, we came, as you see, with many initiative, legislative initiatives which have to get articulated, starting with the emission trading scheme, with the effort sharing regulation, uh, land use, land use change, and uh, forestries, but also, and particularly important for uh, hydrogen, energy efficiency, renewables. So all these, are, these initiatives are currently. Uh, now tabled by the Commission, and we work further more on initiatives related to the gas market and the use of hydrogen in the context of, uh, of the gas markets and how to better plan the infrastructures for electricity, gas, and hydrogen in, in Europe. Briefly, if you move to the next slide, I would say that you see here uh, what is in uh, the Fit for 55 package, as we call, and hydrogen. First of all, is a renewable uh, directive with now a 40% target for renewables in, in Europe and with specific sub-targets for the construction of renewable hydrogen in industry, 50% by 2030, and in, uh, in transport, 2.6%. We have also uh, promoted uh, changes in the framework for accounting renewable hydrogen and creating a level playing field with uh, other uh, advanced biofuels, for example, and to extend the system of certification for renewable fuels. On the next slide, I would uh, mention that the alternative fuel infrastructure regulation came uh, also as a proposal from the Commission with uh, uh, a requirement to have refueling stations available each 150 kilometers in Europe for, by 2030. Also, I would mention the fuel EU maritime proposals to stimulate the uptake of sustainable fuels, including hydrogen. The emission trading scheme and now the production of hydrogen electrolyzers is also covered. So it's a cap and trade system which allows also hydrogen production facilities using renewable energy to benefit from this and to become uh, more, more competitive. The energy taxation directive, which promotes preferential tax rates for the use of renewable and low carbon hydrogen and differentiate between the different types of fuels we, we have based on their carbon intensity. And last but not least, is this proposal for a decarbonized gas and hydrogen market, which is now due in December, and for which we had a public consultation or ended uh, this uh, June. And I can say that already we have seen a very strong interest and also uh, convergence of ideas, at least around the fact that we need to better plan the integration of the energy system to look at electricity, gas, and hydrogen together and to see how better make use of the resources we have and the renewable potential we have, which I think is very much in line also with what we have seen in the recent announcement from Japan. So on the next slide, I would just briefly say that we pay a lot of attention, we continue to pay a lot of attention to international cooperation. We cooperate in um, a structured energy dialogue with uh, OECD and developing countries, and here Japan is a very strong example. But we also participate in, uh, in the International Partnership for Hydrogen Economy. And here we aim to develop together and the next workshop after this one we have with Japan will be exactly on methodologies for greenhouse gas emission calculations for the carbon footprint of the different production pathway for, for hydrogen and how can we promote and support an international market for renewable and low carbon hydrogen, which will be certified and guaranteed. And so to build the trust around this and for international trade. And the Clean Energy Ministerial Hydrogen Initiative, where we have identified a number of global aspirational goals also cooperating with Japan. And we look at uh, promoting more the role of ports 
in the international markets and we have an initiative all global force coalition which is really attracting a lot of interest across the world and uh, we will uh, move uh, again on this we do pay a lot of attention of course the cooperation with our neighbors being in the east or in the south with the green energy initiative with africa and we see the role in particular of, uh, of renewable hydrogen in this field to contribute to the three pillars objectives we we have this is very brief because uh, I don't have a lot of time, but uh, the slides will be available and I'm happy to answer if you have any question. In any case, I will stay with you and uh, we wish to have together a very good uh, seminar this time as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'd like to move on to a presentation from the Japan side. Uh, uh, the uh, most updated information about Japan's uh, policies. I would like to invite uh, Ms. Yukari Hino uh, with the Hydrogen Fuel Strategy Office of uh, the Agency for Natural Resources Energy, METI. Please. And this is the uh, second uh, uh, Japan uh, EU uh, uh, the e hydrogen uh, workshop. Uh, I am uh, a successor to Mr. Hino. My name is uh, Hino, uh, Mr. Shirai. And uh, the last meeting, uh, the first seminar was at, held at the end of May. I would like to update you on the uh, Japanese policies. Next page, please. Looking back, uh, in October 2020, Prime Minister Suda, Suga announced the carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, reducing the green gas emission by 46% compared to 2013. Uh, and uh, so uh, the atmosphere in Japan uh, changed dramatically with this. Uh, there have been two moves on the government of Japan side. I would like to report on this. Number one, the green uh, growth strategy. Uh, the government decided on this on June 18th. And along the lines of this, uh, the uh, uh, description uh, in the uh, strategy, the government's policies will be implemented. Number two, the uh, revision of the basic energy policy. It's a, uh, we are receiving public comments, so this could change, but I don't want to introduce this to you. The next page about uh, green is growth strategy. The uh, government, uh, the uh, uh, private sector companies have a cash and cash equivalent amounting to 240 trillion yen. would like to, well, uh, deploy uh, policies uh, uh, to uh, translate this into investment activities. We'd like to collaborate internationally for this. As you see, we set uh, priority technologies and uh, by 2050, uh, we would like to support uh, the development and introduction. There are four points from one through four, the R&D phase, the government fund will be used uh, uh, for supporting uh, the private sector companies uh, and uh, toward the demonstration phase, the, uh, and also uh, the scale-up phase and the uh, commercial phase, the, the government fund and tax and uh, regulatory reform uh, will be used for supporting these efforts. There are five major uh, policy tools. Number one is uh, grant funding. Uh, at uh, NEDO, I think uh, there's going to be a presentation by a representative of uh, NEDO. Uh, the, uh, they have uh, finance uh, funds of 2 trillion yen for 10 years. Next, uh, about tax, the, the uh, uh, production facility for uh, fuel cells, uh, which is a key for carbon neutrality. And also there's going to be a tax credit uh, for decarbonization at uh, plants. Regarding finance, uh, well, uh, we are going to establish a, a interest subsidy system uh, which is already in place uh, for a long-term uh, funding that requires more than 10 years. For regulatory reform, in the case of hydrogen, uh, we would like to uh, promote uh, the procurement of carbon-free power. And the last point is international collaboration. Uh, well, as we are doing uh, right now, we'd like to promote uh, a dialogue uh, and a variety of uh, cooperation. Next page. Uh, there are 14 uh, sectors and uh, hydrogen is part of this. Next page. So uh, I said that two trillion fund and uh, 
So uh, we would like to, uh, we're promoting a variety of projects uh, for hydrogen. I would like to introduce to you two. Number one is this. The, we would like to establish a hydrogen supply chain. And right now uh, for our transport, uh, we have MCH and uh, the liquid, uh, liquefied hydrogen in Japan. We are now trying to demonstrate this, but we would like to uh, enhance this to the commercial scale. And uh, so in the case of liquid hydro, uh, hydrogen, it's a small scale, but in the commercial scale, the structure would be different. So uh, we are going to promote the use of actual uh, equipment. As for MCH, the cost should be reduced uh, to see whether MCH can be uh, produced uh, from uh, hydrogen uh, or water and uh, uh, true end. Uh, for uh, a reduction of uh, cost. And uh, eventually uh, the uh, hydrogen supply cost should be brought down to 30 yen per uh, uh, cubic uh, normal meter by 2030. Next page. And uh, the second project uh, is this. In Japan, uh, we have uh, uh, the largest uh, water electrolyzer in Fukushima, but again, cost is an issue. So. Uh, the alkali type or uh, larger PEM type uh, modularization, uh, basic technologies development for membranes would be promoted. And also we would like to move ahead with uh, power to X for mixed combustion uh, of hydrogen and soil combustion of uh, hydrogen so that the cost can be reduced to one sixth of the present cost. So uh, that's the green growth strategy and the two trillion yen fund about uh, the hydrogen. And uh, now I would like to talk to you about uh, uh, the basic energy strategy. Next page. Well, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a very busy slide. I hope uh, you read it at your leisure, but uh, toward carbon neutrality by 2050. What are the thoughts? First, uh, we'd like to conserve energy for improvement of energy consumption efficiency. And also we'd like to electrify the e power sector with uh, uh, decarbonization, decarbonized uh, power source. And uh, also we would like to electrify sectors where uh, the electrification is possible in non-electric uh, power sector. And uh, for industrial sector, uh, we will promote a decarbonization uh, by using hydro reduction, uh, hydrogen reduction and steel making, for example. Also in consumer sectors, building and so on, the electrification uh, we believe will be promoted but uh, the hydrogen and uh, synthetic methane should also be used. In transport sector, uh, we have uh, uh, EVs and also FCVs, particularly for uh, commercial vehicles and, bus and buses and trucks. Uh, hydrogen would be a, a major uh, source of energy. We would like to promote that. Next page, please. So, uh, on the energy supply basis, what uh, is the picture? You see uh, uh, the uh, numbers here. And uh, in the basic energy supply, uh, this is the positioning that you see on the next page. And uh, this is uh, the power uh, supply basis. These are the numbers. And next page. Now, uh, in the basic energy policy, or uh, what are we going to do with hydrogen? Now, the hydrogen uh, should be implemented in the society. That's our positioning of uh, hydrogen. For hydrogen to be used in uh, society, costs should be brought down because it's uh, still high. Cost reduction is the key. And uh, you see, uh, we have a description of the cost reduction target at uh, uh, hydrogen station. Um, we'd like to reduce it to uh, 30 yen by 2030 and 20 yen uh, by 2050, so that it can be brought down to the level of uh, uh, fossil fuel. Some people say the cost can be brought down further, but uh, anyway, uh, we would like to demonstrate uh, uh, R&D using the fund uh, and uh, also we'd like to create a larger demand. And as you see on this page, uh, the use of uh, hydrogen will be promoted in all possible sectors, uh, transport, consumption, consumer and household. But uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the 
a hydrogen can be used in a major manner in the power generation sector. So we'd like to uh, promote that. And also in the transport sector, we have uh, more than 150 uh, hydrogen stations and a little less than 6,000 FCVs from next fiscal year. Uh, we would like to promote the uh, introduction of trucks uh, that uses use uh, uh, hydrogen. So we'd like to create a large demand for hydrogen for better uh, profitability. Next page. So these are the things that we are going to do and the use of hydrogen, uh, is, well, they should be promoted uh, globally, not just in Japan uh, and also by the EU. So we'd like to uh, build a momentum globally so uh, we would like to build uh, dialogues and consensus of use of hydrogen uh, with this in mind we have launched the hydrogen energy ministry uh, meeting uh, we're collaborating with the iaa this year we would like to uh, well uh, build a momentum thank you from MHI, so the represent the industry uh, from Mitsubishi Heavy Industry, Mr. Satoshi uh, Tanimura representing Mitsubishi uh, Heavy Industry, representing the industrial sector. Uh, I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to presentation at the EU and Japan uh, workshop. So now I'm preparing my presentation. Okay. Okay, I, I can start. <laughs> and, okay, Hi. So, yes, I can see your uh, screen. Now, today uh, I will introduce the uh, image group uh, energy transition policy and the uh, technology of the hydrogen gas turbines. Then uh, this slide shows the uh, MHA group uh, the energy transition uh, policies. So, uh, so uh, uh, how to say the carbon neutral world of uh, uh, 2050 will not be a rape forward in one step. So it is necessary to steadily reduce the carbon uh, CO2 emission while using the technology that can be used in practically at the time. So this slide shows the, uh, the that steps. So MHA group uh, aim to realize the carbon neutral uh, society in the uh, 2050s. Then uh, so contributing the many technologies for the decarbonization, and finally we are uh, building the hydrogen value chains. Okay. Then this slide show the uh, our technology roadmap for the uh, power generation equipment, especially in the, especially in the Mitsubishi power uh, products. Then we have the three steps. So first step is uh, uh, improving the efficiency of the uh, gas turbines to reduce the uh, fossil fuel consumption. The next step is the uh, carbon capture and recovery or the uh, or, uh, recoveries. Then finally, uh, 2030, uh, we will realize the zero emission, uh, no, 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 carbon neutral fuel, uh, power generation equipment, like hydrogen gas turbine, um, ammonia gas turbine, and the uh, uh, hydrogen SFCs. Okay. The next slide shows the, uh, the, the this is the uh, 
important role of the hydrogen uh, gas turbines. So, uh, <clears throat> how to say the, uh, so the power generation sector is a very large uh, source of the CO2 emission. So, hydrogen and ammonia gas turbine is a very uh, important for in, in, in this sector. The good point of the uh, hydrogen gas turbine is uh, one is a minimum uh, investment. So, that means it, gas turbine itself has a very uh, how to say, flexible fuel, uh, fuel ranges. So we can use many kinds of the fuel, just uh, replace the combustors. In case of the hydrogen, uh, we can change the combustor in the maintenance period. The second is a uh, good point is a uh, gas turbine combined cycle has a big capacity. So that means a one uh, power plant is a equal of the 200, uh, 2 million a fuel cell vehicle cars penetration. The second is a uh, hydrogen gas turbine don't need the pure hydrogen like a FCB. So we can use the cheap hydrogen. Then reduce the hydrogen. We can reduce the hydrogen cost. The final flexible operation is very important. From now, the renewable energy is penetrating in the uh, power grid. The, Gas turbine itself has a very uh, large capacity of the, how to say, load following capacity. So that means hydrogen gas turbine can help the uh, fluctuating of the renewable energy uh, power grid. That is very important uh, role of the hydrogen gas turbines. Then this slide is uh, today's most important uh, information in, uh, in my presentation. Uh, so uh, for the technology way to the using the hydrogen, hydrogen itself has a very flammable uh, fuel. So need some special care to uh, avoid the flashback or dynamics. Then now we are preparing the three types of the com hydrogen combustors. We can use these combustors for the, the uh, according to the, the gas turbine frame or uh, co-firing ra ratio of the hydrogen. Then next uh, pro uh, topic is uh, ammonia. Ammonia is a, a very good hydrogen carrier. And also the uh, one of the very good carbon neutral fuels. But uh, ammonia combustion uh, generates the huge amount of the uh, NOx emission. Then we are preparing the two solutions. Then one is a, for the large frame gas turbine. Current large frame gas turbine has a very high efficiency, like 64%. That is realized by the very high firing temperature, 1600 degrees C, such a high temperature. In, if we burn the ammonia in the, such a high temperature, so, very big uh, emission, uh, NOx emission is uh, generating over the thousand ppm. So we cannot burn the directly in the in the combustor. So now we are developing the ammonia cracking gas turbine systems. So we we can use the high temperature exhaust energy for the ammonia cracking. Then uh, we generate the hydrogen, then go to the uh, gas turbine fuels. That, that is one of the solutions. The second is the <clears throat> ammonia direct combustion gas turbines. That is, will be applied in the small frame gas turbines. Small frame gas turbine has a little bit lower firing temperature, like uh, 1300 degrees C. The other time that we can burn the ammonia directly, then at that time that we can avoid such a big systems, the more simple system is available. Now uh, Mitsubishi Group is uh, uh, developing the, this, these ammonia gas turbines and also the, uh, we are preparing the, these three types of the hydrogen combustors. Okay. 
And then uh, this, uh, this slide shows the next topics. Now, uh, <clears throat> we are uh, using the, so such a gas turbine core competence, then uh, we are, uh, how to say, uh, so some, uh, so we are participating in some, uh, so decarbonization uh, effort or uh, feasibility studies all over the world. So the Europe and the United States has uh, um, has many kind of the such uh, decarbonization activities. The, some of the activities in uh, Asia and Australia. The, today uh, I I will introduce the one of the topics of the in the uh, United Kingdom. So this slide shows the uh, how to say, uh, zero carbon handbags project. So uh, our company and the other uh, no, no, better. 12 uh, companies uh, applied to the British uh, hydrogen, uh, British government uh, grant, grant. The first step of the, this project is, a, oh, sorry, uh, is a uh, power plant in a uh, certain, certain is a, uh, near the Kingston upon Hull City, the, we uh, we have the user in this area. Then this com uh, gas turbine will be uh, switched to the thirty at first thirty percent hydrogen co-firing, and finally going to the hundred percent hydrogen firing. Okay. That is one of the sample of the, our project. Then, uh, and also the, not only the gas turbine, the MHA group has, uh, now we have many partnership and our uh, products related in a hydrogen, especially in hydrogen products production. Then, uh, <clears throat> uh, so contributing the, the hydrogen society's uh, activities. Okay. Then uh, this is the end of the, my presentation. So this picture is uh, our uh, Mitsubishi Power Takasawa's works. Uh, then uh, this uh, workshop has uh, many kind of the hydrogen uh, equipment and also the power generation test equipment. So at once, please come to see and this <laughs> works. Thank you very much. ありがとうございました。それではあの引き続いてですね、ヨーロッパ初のプロジェクトを。Thank you very much. Moving on to Europe. Now we would like to go to the European example of steel industry. This is Group Japan. KK, we have Mr. Bolte, the president. Please go ahead. I hope you can hear me. My name is Nicolas Bolze. I'm representing Tucson Group here in Japan. Next slide, please. Tucson Group is an international group of companies with across 60 countries is generating approximately 29 billion euro turnover per year. Um, you might know us as a steel manufacturer, but actually, meanwhile, we have uh, much more. We are a producer of hydrogen in our department plant technology, which you can see here on the right side. And we are a user of hydrogen by using hydrogen in our steel manufacturing process. Please, next slide. <clears throat> Every ton of steel produced emitted approximately 1.85 tons of carbon dioxide, equating to about 8% of global carbon dioxide emissions. So it's a huge impact. For us, keeping the Paris Agreement in focus, 
steel making at ThyssenKrupp in Germany is to be climate neutral by 2050. As an initial target, ThyssenKrupp is aiming to reduce emissions from its own production and processes and from the purchase of energy by 30% versus the base year 2018 by 2030. This concerns on one hand emissions from our own production and processes, which are called scope one, according to the greenhouse gas protocol. And on the other hand, the emissions from the purchase of energy, which are part of scope two. To us, climate neutrality also refers to indirect emissions along the value chain. We also want to reduce them by 16% by 2030, which is part of scope three of the greenhouse gas protocol. Despite the goal of becoming carbon neutral in Europe, still being 29 years in the future, it's critical to act now. As we all know, industrial sites have a lifetime exceeding 50 years and investment planning horizons of 10 to 15 years. Asset and footprint decisions need to be made today and must follow a clear decarbonization roadmap. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we have a two-pass roadmap. Within our climate strategy, we have defined several milestones to reach these goals. We are pursuing an open approach and focusing on two parallel, equally important routes. Number one, and you see it in the left lower corner, the avoidance of CO2 through the use of hydrogen, and number two, the use of CO2 produced in steel making. It will be impossible to, to stop the CO2 production immediately to zero, so we have to find some ways to use the produced CO2 and other aspects. The CDA, Carbon Direct Avoidance Pass, focuses on replacing the reducing agent coal with hydrogen. While using coal leads to CO2, using hydrogen only emits steam. The reducing agent is used to process iron ore into pure iron, which is then being processed into steel. While hydrogen can partially replace coal in our currently used blast furnaces, full climate neutrality will require a technological change. Instead of blast furnaces, we are going to use direct reduction plants. Running these on hydrogen allows for zero CO2. While the blast furnace produces liquid pig iron, the direct reduction plants produce solid sponge iron. To further process the sponge iron in our steel mills, we need to melt it down first and are building new innovative melting units powered by green energy. Together, the direct reduction plant and the melting unit can fully replace a blast furnace and thus allow for a seamless integration into our existing production chain. Next slide. <clears throat> this is Carbon to Can. 18 partners from industry and research started to combine climate protection and competitiveness in the Carbon to Chem project in June 2016. As part of the joint project, which is funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, with a total of 120 million euros, solutions are being worked on that produces a raw material from the chemical industry from the climate damaging CO2 produced in industrial production. By networking the various sectors and using renewable energy, CO2 is turned into a valuable raw material for the climate friendly production, for example, synthetic fuels, plastic or basic chemicals. The goal of carbon to chem is to make use of CO2 emissions 
from German industrial processes sustainability by 2030. So this, what you are seeing here, is already working since December 2018. Next slide. <clears throat> here are some other concrete uh, hydrogen related projects. In every case, we can say that our demand for hydrogen will be extremely high, but we have already started to find ways of meeting it at an early stage. We are in talks and joint projects with different partners for meeting our increased hydrogen demand and securing connections to the respective grid. Together with STEAG and ThyssenKrupp Uden, we are looking into the erection and operation of an electrolysis plant with a capacity of up to 500 megawatt. In 2019, we initiated a feasibility study on blue hydrogen together with the Norwegian energy company Equinor and gas transmission system operator OGE, which has been concluded in early 2021. The study finds that the production and supply of the steel site is technically feasible. The political framework requires some more detailing. So I don't want to go on the further examples here. I'm sorry, but the time is running out, but I would like to shift to the last slide, which is important from my point of view. The transformation will be only successful if policymakers create the appropriate framework. Coming back to steel as a conclusion, only for the German steel industry, the total costs are estimated at around 30 billion euro. Around 130 terawatt hours of renewable energy will be necessary purely for the production of iron and steel. To make it very clear, the technological path is clear but the transformation will also require the right political guidance. We are going to require large amounts of climate neutrally produced hydrogen. We must prevent carbon leakage. The transfer of CO2 intensive industries from Europe to other countries. There is no point in making great demands on domestic industry with a view to climate protection if we do not protect this industry from inferior standards in other regions of the world. Moreover, we have to create a hydrogen market very soon. We need the appropriate grid infrastructure and the regulatory framework. So I'm getting a reminder that I have to stop. I think this is where Japan and the European Union can work together to agree and to align on this appropriate framework for these future technologies. And by this, I would like to switch to the last slide and uh, say thank you for your attention and maybe meet you later in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now we would like to move on to a presentation on uh, land transport. Uh, originating in Japan. I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Herbst uh, from uh, uh, the Toyota Motor Europe, please. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you very much for having Toyota at this uh, EU Japan workshop. My name is Stefan Herbst. I'm taking the head hydrogen power train and fuel cell business unit Toyota Motor Europe. And I'm also a member of the management board of the Hydrogen Council. So let me start with some overview um, coming from the Hydrogen Council and, and McKinsey. Next, please. Um, what we, we realize is um, we do this, and that is important to recognize, of course, in order to decarbonize various um, sectors. And in, in the work we are doing, we see that already 75% of GDP, countries representing 75% of GDP globally, have either already introduced net carbon targets or introduced carbon pricing. That is a very important um, frame in which we are acting. In this frame, we see that the number of hydrogen projects, and you see here the announced investments and uh, the announced projects are increasing. 
And in this quarterly update that we are giving, we see an acceleration. So already here, you see 359 projects that comes from 280 just a couple of months. And we are working on the, the next update, which already shows more than 400 projects. Um, within this acceleration, we see that uh, Europe with the, uh, the framework, the hydrogen strategies, um, seems to take the lead because clearly the number of projects and investment that is currently happening in Europe uh, is by far the, the largest uh, movement as we see. Next slide, please. And now let me turn back to our activities in, uh, in Toyota. Um, next, please. We had 20 years of experience of developing these technologies before we introduced Mirai in 2014, 2015. Initially, we focused on resolving the technical issues. Important is that we don't need for a fuel cell a technology breakthrough. The technology is reliable, it is ready, it is performing. But the challenge is to further work on the cost reduction. And this is uh, what I would like to focus on um, very briefly in my presentations. Next, please. The key elements to reduce the cost for us is one, to work on a multi-component strategy. Of, we have hybrids, plug-in hybrids, battery electric and fuel cell. And part of this um, cost reduction is that we use the core elements of this electrification motor, battery, power control, and the experience we have in various technologies of which also fuel cell benefit. Next is the system cost as such. We could reduce um, the system cost from the previous to uh, this generation Mirai to one third uh, by making the system more compact, by reducing uh, the amount of platinum, um, by, but by also by increasing and um, um, the production process and the speed of the production. So that is a very important element as well that is contributing obviously to the overall cost reduction. Another element is the next slide is scale. We uh, produced 3000 Mirai uh, first generation. Now this moved up 10 times. Uh, current production target is 30,000 uh, fuel cell stacks per year. So this scale also helps to drive down the cost. And last but not least, uh, the next slide is we are started to diversify. Um, the supply of components, specifically the tanks, um, the stacks, but also base components. And important here is that the stack from the Mirai can be utilized in various other applications um, to power them. And that is a key differentiator also of the fuel cell technologies to, to other technologies. Let me give you some examples in the next slide. This gives you an overview about the current corporations uh, we have on hydrogen projects in Japan, but also in China, in the US, and in Europe. And in Europe, just let me highlight on this slide the, the corporation with uh, BMW. So I went yesterday to Munich and I could test drive the all new uh, BMW iX5 hydrogen car. So that's a great result showing what can be achieved between a Japanese and a European German um, company on, on hydrogen. Other examples um, in Japan, next slide, please, is we are developing together with Hino, um, this truck to be expected uh, in 2022. So the truck sector is one of the key sectors that still needs decarbonization. And it's not easy to decarbonize because of the high power demand and of um, the user demand in, in this sector, but we believe that hydrogen will play a crucial role in this segment. And that is why with Hino and uh, the partners you see here, customers are very important as well, groups that I will test um, this truck. That is on the, on the road under development. Next slide is another segment, is uh, smaller, medium-sized trucks. Here, this truck is already um, on the road uh, with 7-Eleven and other partners. Um, here we uh, verify uh, the usability in operation, uh, the reduction of CO2, the business case, and also the utilization of this vehicle in Japan for emergency cases. Um, and internally, we, you know, we use this to fine tune the specifications and also improve the uh, and work on the hydrogen um, consumption. Another example, moving to Europe. 
Um, in Europe, we partnered with Caetano Bass in, in Portugal. And uh, we have developed uh, jointly this bus, also powered by uh, Toyota Stack. As you can see, the bus has a driving range of 400 kilometer, which is essential for, for bus operators to keep flexibility in their daily bus operations. Actually, this bus is now co-branded um, Toyota Caetano. It is on sale and uh, we realize a big demand, increasing demand of European cities on their way to uh, net zero emissions um, for, for these buses. Uh, the bus is available in 10 and a half meter and 12 meter version at this moment. And Caetano, we are working also in 18 meter buses, but also coaches and, uh, and co-bus, airport buses. Next example. Um, with our other partners in Europe, the Energy Observer Development, we are working on stationary and range extender units for small maritime in an um, FCHE rail project together with CAF on rail applications and with Corvus in Norway on ferry on maritime applications. So again, this shows the broad usability of hydrogen technologies to help various transport modes um, to decarbonize. And it again shows the cooperation between European and, and Japanese um, companies to move um, towards the overall goal of uh, decarbonization. The next slide, what is important as well, and I was asked to focus also on the Japanese situation specifically, is to create this framework because we need to create hydrogen society. That means we need to align hydrogen production, the transport, the infrastructure, and then the utilization in various sectors, um, supporting specifically also by financial institution. And in order to accelerate and coordinate this, the Japan Hydrogen Association was created as several working groups who are currently working to make this vision a reality. And I should also mention here that hydrogen is of course green, but also blue, including fossil fuels with CCS um, technology. Next slide, and here I summarize very briefly. Um, we develop uh, various electrified vehicles and technology line up by utilizing our core and strengthening our core technology. The new Mirai, I think, is a very good product to stimulate, especially also the infrastructure to motivate customers to buy hydrogen vehicles, which helps the fuel cell market. We spread the technology in Europe and, and other regions in various applications and with various partners and together with governments, private companies, but also um, Sasaki-san, of course, with academics is a very important partner as well, and financial sectors, we will jointly pursue to realize carbon um, hydrogen society towards carbon neutrality. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's move on. It's going to be the last presentation, the fourth presentation representing the enterprise from Europe, uh, representing the uh, the air transport industry, H3 Dynamics. Uh, Mr. Benafla, Samir Benafla, would you please take the floor? Hello. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor to represent H3 Dynamics. I will speak about hydrogen in air mobility. Uh, I am Samia Benafla, Head of Sales for Japan Asia Pacific. H3 Dynamics vision is simple and clear. We are working towards um, building autonomous and zero carbon flight. However, many different complex steps are required to achieve this goal. We are doing it in three steps in order, data acquisition and use, cargo delivery, and passenger flights. Power density, flight time, flight range, weight. Hydrogen is the future of electric decarbonized flights. Enables regional and international flights, notably with the liquid state of hydrogen. Hydrogen is on in our DNA. For almost 20 years, 
our founders and CEO has been advocating and pushing um, hydrogen to decarbonize mobility and its infrastructure. So for example, heavy vehicles on the road and throughout air mobility, deploying associated businesses such as end-to-end -end solution platforms using FC drones, AI engine, and telerobotics. So we have, I'll address the slide before. Oh, okay, so next, next one, please. Think big, but start small. This is a motto of our CEO who started by creating and selling educational uh, hydrogen kit for schools. And our first mobility car was actually a toy car, FC car, that allowed us to make money. Over the years, we crafted the technology, iterated, made money, reinvested in R&D and techno development. To arrive to the top right of the screen with our sister company called Heisen, now uh, freshly listed on NASDAQ. H3 Dynamics is following the same steps. To give you a regional uh, and a global setup, we are localized in Europe, in Paris, and we have also uh, Toulouse as a lab for aeronautics. We are in the US, in Austin, where we develop and craft all hydrogen systems. And in Asia, uh, based in Singapore, Hong Kong, and right now developing the Tokyo office for more the data and AI platform. About our PRAS projects, uh, back in 2006, actually, we were selected by NASA to power the first uh, hydrogen UAV flight. This happened in the Nevada desert. And as you can see, we crafted and integrated the system for a fixed wing. Back to Europe, uh, this is in 2007 with DLR, the German Aeronautics Center, mandated us to craft the H2 system for their platform. You can see like that interesting shape. And this uh, flew over the Swiss Alps. I will not go through all the past projects, but as you can see, we have been crafting and integrating system through different UAV platforms, either fixed wings, multi-rotors, eVTOL, for different type of clients, uh, Boeing, Airbus, uh, Nordic, Unmanned. Over our 15 years of expertise, we reached many successes and milestone for the system integration for many clients. And in 2018, a shift uh, was announced with the Element One, the first H2 distributed plane. And in 2019, we launched also our own fuel cell drone, the Hycopter. As you may know, mobility means nothing without infrastructure. And so we went ahead and already offering and developing products to help our clients. We have, for example, the H2 refueling trailer. About our products, this is the AeroStack. This is our own light fuel cell systems crafted designed for air mobility. It has identified and accredited by Solar Impulse for the air mobility. While battery drones fly time is about 30 to 40 minutes, FC drones has the capacity to extend six times the flight time. Our helicopter, for example, can fly 3.5 hours with no payload and three hours with about two kilo payloads. So that opens new use cases for BVLOS flights beyond the visual line of sight. For example, pipelines and infra inspections, uh, long emergency cargo delivery, or continuous security monitoring. Mobility platform without the environment and infrastructure is not useful. And we have a range of accessories and already developing a mobile F um, hydrogen refueling trailer. So that brings the hydrogen with you on site everywhere. About our current projects uh, in Netherlands, we actually are uh, equipping with the Student Association Aerodelf their, uh, their platform. And this is our aerostack inside. In France, we are really proud uh, to be part of the Mermos project. We are actually co-building with Super Aero this ultra long range uh, UAV. Uh, so it will, it will fly across the South Atlantic from Senegal to Brazil. It will be around like 30 to 40 hours flight using liquid hydrogen. I hope that will be part of history as well. H3 Dynamics has been uh, selected by Paris Airport to be part of the Urban Air Mobility Hub. As you can see um, in the list on the right, we are the only player 
like really specialist into the hydrogen presently. On the left side, uh, you can see that uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, uh, during VivaTech was visiting H3 Dynamics and discussed about our technology with our CEO, Tara Swankowicz. The future is being built now. We believe that instead of retrofitting technologies and aircraft, the, the next aircraft will be co-designed to adapt to the propulsion system. And this is uh, why we are developing already these pods, the next standard, we hope, of distributing propulsion systems. This one is one kilowatt, for example. UAM and vertiports required infrastructures and also ground mobility vehicles to refuel the aircraft. So this is how it works. Uh, we insert it and boom, it's ready to fly. So, and then the autonomous ground vehicle got back to the base. So we are currently exploring the development. And this is a real uh, prototype that we are making. We gain like uh, media traction. And yeah, this is basically, I would say in short, our roadmap for hydrogen. So we go uh, from unmanned to unmanned flight, but we are doing this step by step. The current focus is also to find connected markets to help this vision. So we have, for example, an AI analytics platform for maintenance called H3Zoom, or we have a drone box for autonomous flights as well called DBX. We have a strong connection with Japan and many Japanese companies actually founded us and we are part of the Mirai Fund. Thank you, Toyota. Uh, we have clients. We are discussing about distribution. Uh, we were detected by METI in their Swiss or Doron uh, reports for disaster response or distribution in depopulated and remote areas, for example. So we are really proud to be part of it. We believe that we have many synergies uh, that exist between uh, what we envision and the Japan strategy. The Society 5.0, basic H2 strategy, and 2050 carbon neutral is in the heart of what we do. Of course, we have challenges. Uh, for example, have access as a startup to grant uh, and uh, being able to be inside of the co-development for use cases with startup. So not using startup as a supplier, but as a co-developer. So we are looking for partners, getting involved more into open innovation programs, being part of POCs. We are looking for distributors and we would love to talk to air mobility makers and regulators. And of course, being part of the H2 uh, infrastructure development discussions. So to finish, we are really audacious, not arrogant. We stay humble and we are looking forward to co-develop the future of air mobility in Japan with Japan. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a great pleasure and honor. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much. Now I'll just uh, say that the 10 minutes which was scheduled for Q&A has already been passed. So if you have questions, please enter your questions in chat. Your questions will be respectively answered. But this is a great opportunity. So four of the speakers who just made presentation, I'd like to ask just one question. You can give us one minute answer to my question. You have explained wonderful initiatives that you are working on. But generally speaking, if you look at EU and Japan, they have agenda for cooperation. So the question is, how can we collaborate to a larger extent? So citing your experiences, I believe there are government officials listening in. Can you try to answer my question? How can we enhance our collaboration? Starting with Mr. Tanimura from Mitsubishi Heavy Industry, please. Thank you. Can I answer this question in Japanese? Yes. In our case, gas turbine, the big equipment, we have been involved with hydrogen, with this large scale equipment. So large scale utility companies are involved in this business. So we started to participate in relevant European projects of large scale electricity. Water electrolysis is also another area of partnership recently. Hamburg hydrogen project, for example. We are participating on the supply side of the business. 
So you are already steadily promoting cooperation. That's what you're saying. Yes, luckily in Europe, London, Germany, and Paris, we have locations, presence there. So locally, we can participate in the local projects. Thank you very much. Now from ThyssenKrupp, Bote-san, President Bote, you've emphasized the collaboration at the end of your presentation. So between Japan and EU, what can we do to enhance and strengthen the collaboration? Your answer would be, please. Yes, I believe we are partners on a technical eye level. Companies from Japan and companies from Europe are, are meeting on, on, the same, on the same standard. So we should promote the, the future specifications and roll it out globally. So uh, I believe uh, Japan and e European companies are well positioned to set future standards mm. and to make them valid uh, on, a, on a global base. And by this, of course, expanding our industry and uh, providing benefits to our economies. Thank you very much. We have actually similar discussion in steel industry. Uh, they are working on carbon neutrality. The steels that are made with carbon neutrality tend to cost more. The prices are higher, but we are trying to encourage consumers to purchase green steel. If we can set the standard rules globally, our efforts will be rewarded. Same for Germany, German companies and Japanese companies. We have to make sure working together that we benefit from that rulemaking. So rulemaking yes. is the area EU is very strong. You can lead the whole world by making rules. Thank you very much. Now from Toyota Motor uh, Europe, Hubs, Mr. Hubs, you have been engaged in uh, EU Japan collaboration. Can we enhance this? How can we do this? Yeah, thank you very much. I think on, on what was mentioned, technical level already, we have many corporations between companies and also an academic academic level, there is a close collaboration between Japan and, uh, and Europe. Um, I would compare the hydrogen society with an aircraft. We are just on, on the starting point. The aircraft is ready, we want to take off, but what we need is a good control tower. And this control tower has to set the standards, the harmonization, and it has to, to coordinate because uh, to lift this hydrogen society, we need to bring all players together, the hydrogen production, the transport, um, and the utilization in, in various sectors. So this is a huge uh, task where I think we uh, can mutually enhance and learn from each other how to bring this aircraft, this hydrogen society to life. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Right. Uh, we have a high expectation. Japanese investors are also investing. So, in this respect, in many ways, uh, I hope uh, this uh, uh, trend will uh, spread globally. So, lastly, H3 Dynamics. Uh, just uh, perhaps uh, one word uh, from you, please. Sure. Thank you very much for. This, uh, this question, it's really interesting because um, as a startup, we believe that indeed the hydrogen ecosystem needs to be structured. Uh, now, we believe that it's important to enable in early conversation, the smaller players, the startups, who are also making the future of air mobility in hydrogen, for example. Uh, and um, yeah, I would say that's, uh, that's one of my big, I would say, message. Here. Great. Uh, well, uh, your activities are quite encouraging. Uh, so uh, we would like to support all the startups uh, globally. So we are uh, counting on you. So uh, in fact, uh, uh, we have uh, already uh, gone overboard with respect to time for Q&A. So uh, that's it for uh, Q and A, uh, and if you could uh, perhaps uh, uh, ask your questions on the chat, uh, maybe 
the uh, speakers uh, uh, can respond to your questions. So we would like to uh, move on to the next session. The next session is uh, uh, transport, uh, the uh, potential for EU-Japan cooperation in hydrogen use in transport industry and power generation. So from a broader perspective, we would like to hear what uh, uh, the speakers have to say. First, uh, we would like to start with uh, the uh, Japan uh, EU uh, project uh, in the uh, maritime transportation. We have uh, CMB Japan and uh, uh, Mr. Aonuma uh, is the first speaker. So please start. Thank you. I'm Aonuma from CMB Japan. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great honor. So many participants are joining in this webinar. I'm not used to making public presentations. If you have anything that is not clear, please ask me questions. Since the time is limited, I'd like to move on to the next page. Just briefly, I'd like to introduce our company. CMD Group is located in Belgium. In 1989, this company was established. Last year, we celebrated 150 anniversary. It is a major maritime shipping company. We have about 100 ship fleets. We have global business. It is a Belgian national flag carrier. As you can see, we have owner family, the family Savilis. This has 100% uh, the share is a private company. So in Japan, how can we expand our hydrogen business? That is a question. CMB Japan was established 40 years ago. And during those 40 years, shipbuilding, shippers, the financial institutions, we have built sound and strong business relationships with them. In hydrogen business as well, we would like to utilize that platform for Japanese local partners, Japanese partners. We would like to establish and renew the cooperation with the local companies. The centerpiece of our efforts today is the efforts with the Mitsubishi Group. Tsuneishi group. The owner family of Tsuneishi is a Canberra family, and our company's uh, owner family, Severus, they were able to have a dialogue in 2019, and they found the commonality, and they decided to work on this partnership. And the photo you see here on the slide is two months after that first encounter. Uh, Mr. Canberra came to Belgium. In 1917, we built the very first hydrogen ship, Hydro Ville. And on the ship, two gentlemen were discussing on the next hydrogen driven ferry construction. The first thing we worked on, as you can see on this photo, is a small scale commercial passenger ferry, Hydro Bingo. Bingo doesn't mean the game. It's comes from the name of this locality. This is the world's first hydrogen engine ferry since 1919 for two years. It took a long time for us, but relevant ministries, government organizations, and partners helped us to make it possible. Currently in Shunan city of Yamaguchi, Tokuyama uh, Inc carries out this uh, demonstration, which is supported by the Ministry of the Environment, and we participate in this project, providing this ferry. So Hydro Bingo project ended with a great success. And we knew that this technology can be deployed in Japan. We were confident. So we wanted to move on to a more comprehensive partnership. We came to an agreement in April this year. A new operating company, Japan Hydro KK, was established to promote the business. So this is the very first project under this operating company. 
compared to hydro bingo this is larger in scale this is more powerful engine 400 4400 power horse level tugboat currently in the shipbuilding we have already started the specific designing so hopefully by the end of 2023 we want to make sure this um ship will be in front of you for you to be able to enjoy so we tend to focus on ship fleets but as you can see on this slide already we have tracked ahead for the truck we already have construction equipment port facility and also the support ships for offshore wind power we have already realized all of these products which can also be deployed to japan so maritime transport as well as offshore wind facilities will be able to spread the use of hydrogen related technologies we develop now this is our effort on the supply side supply of the hydrogen this is in kita kyushu ito chu and Japan Cokes and we, three of us, are trying to use Cokes oven gas, which is the off gas from the coal. And what we want to do is to create hydrogen to supply that to both land transport and maritime transport. The maximum annual production of hydrogen will be 40,000 tons per year. Of course, maybe not in the initial year, but this 40,000 ton, this represents the amount that can actually support the driving of 600,000 Mirai vehicles. So that is the scale. So we CNB, from uh, the point of view of EU Japan cooperation, we are doing the hydrogen production as well as supplies. So we have double pronged approach. Lastly, sorry, my explanation may not be sufficient. So if you have any questions, please contact me at this email address. I'm willing to answer any question. And at the end of this month in Tokyo, there will be Wind Expo. We will be exhibiting at this expo. So we would welcome your visit there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, we would like to go to the next presentation. Uh, this is a case example of uh, Japan EU uh, cooperation. The Panasonic Safe Earth and Fuel Reserve CHP dissemination in Japan and Europe, an approach for hydrogen power generation. We have Dr. Urata with Panasonic Cooperation. Thank you. I'm uh, Urata with uh, Panasonic. I'm very grateful for this opportunity today. Now, as was uh, mentioned, I would like to talk about the uh, uh, fuel cell, uh, the e e CHP uh, dissemination in Japan and Europe, and uh, uh, what we are doing uh, for uh, hydrogen power generation. As you know, uh, last year, uh, carbon neutrality was announced in Japan in uh, uh, 2017, we established uh, uh, the uh, Panasonic Environment Vision 2050, and this is uh, to uh, uh, ex for uh, allow the energy used to uh, uh, well uh, to uh, uh, well uh, to be uh, smaller than energy created. So, in a farm is uh, 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 well a uh, residential fuel cell CHP. Uh, we he introduce uh, the he, uh, reaction by, of uh, hydrogen from city uh, or LP gas and the hydrogen in the air to generate electricity and uh, hot water. The 97% uh, is the CHP efficiency, electric uh, efficiency is 40%. So, uh, so compared with other equipment, uh, uh, CO2 emission can be reduced by using this energy in a farm. From 1997, we started development, of, uh, and uh, in 2009, for the first time in, in the world, uh, we started uh, selling this uh, in the consumer market, and we have changed the models every two years. And in this fiscal year 2021, 
we launched the seventh generation. Next. This seventh generation, uh, we use IoT technology and uh, uh, to reduce uh, the CO2. And so uh, this uh, is uh, possible to generate power, uh, power in emergency situations, for example, natural disasters. And also the remote software update is possible. The roles of uh, any farm is uh, to reduce uh, CO2 uh, at home. And also uh, this also uh, contributes to the society uh, with a distributed power and disaster resilience. And also we uh, can perhaps uh, play a role uh, for decarbonization as well. In Europe, our uh, fuel cell uh, power uh, generation uh, unit is uh, was uh, uh, launched uh, from Fistmann in Germany in 2014. This first generation product uh, was uh, uh, also, also uh, dealing with uh, e-gas in Europe. And in the second generation, uh, this uh, supported aerial gas. So not just in Germany, but in five countries in Europe, this was launched. And in 2018, we launched a, th a third generation product. And this was sold in seven countries in Europe. Next, this is the latest products. Uh, this uh, is uh, now uh, sold by Wiesmann and uh, uh, Rihama. Well, more than 200,000 uh, uh, units uh, have been uh, uh, produced in Japan. Also, the e for uh, heat uh, generation, um, since uh, this uh, is re greatly related with the uh, uh, household, so it is very important for us to partner with uh, European companies. The e uh, European, uh, the products sold in Europe are well, uh, sold by European companies and we, we, we focus on production. As you know, in Europe, uh, toward a decarbonized society, the uh, renewable energy is uh, being promoted. And uh, from the, uh, in the transition period uh, toward uh, the hydrogen society, uh, there is a plan to mix uh, the hydrogen with uh, natural gas. And uh, so uh, the, even if there's a mixture of uh, hydrogen in the e fuel, it is okay. And uh, our uh, product uh, uh, can have a simpler structure. Uh, that means uh, uh, we can evolve toward a better product. And as you, on the left-hand side, we have the natural gas fuel cell. On the uh, right-hand side, we have a pure hydrogen fuel cells of uh, a pure uh, uh, hydrogen and the e fuel processor is no longer uh, there on the right hand side, but uh, important parts uh, such as cell stack can be used for the e right hand side product as well. In October this year, the e five kilowatt uh, uh, the e pure hydrogen fuel cell will be launched, and this can be used alone. Not only that, but if you combine multiple units and connect them then uh, uh, a larger uh, well, uh, the capacity the, the power generation can happen. So for, from five watt to maximum 10 megawatt uh, can be generated uh, by using multiple units. Uh, so uh, by combining the uh, small capacity products, uh, you can freely use your own uh, layout and uh, can still generate uh, uh, high power. If you combine uh, small units, usually the cost will go up, but uh, uh, the, we have, uh, uh, well, we, we believe we can uh, make a, a cost uh, uh, efficient uh, proposal. To make it happen, uh, we are involved in uh, demonstration projects. On the left hand side, the Olympic Paralympic uh, uh, site uh, Harami flag will be established there and five kilowatt product, uh, 24 units uh, will be combined for commercial use. On the right hand side, uh, this is our factory and the e solar cell panels, the e storage battery and uh, uh, the e pure hydrogen uh, fuel cells are combined. And uh, uh, so the, we would like to do this demonstration and establish this know-how so that uh, the technology can be used for other applications as well.
So in various parts of the world, including Europe, hydrogen value initiative is happening. In this uh, initiative, we uh, are going to establish a, a supply chain value chain of hydro, uh, uh, hydrogen and our uh, pure hydrogen uh, fuel cell uh, can be used. And uh, that is where we believe uh, uh, we can uh, um, make more values. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'd like to move on to the next presentation. Uh, this time from Europe. So we'd like to hand over to Europe. Uh, the hydrogen utilization innovation support at Horizon Europe, EU support from the uh, European Commission, uh, DG Research and Innovation. Uh, Mr. Jerome Schippers, would you please take the floor? Yes, thank you, Chair, and, uh, and many thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, to the next slide, please, straight away. Um, this slide really summarizes some of the parts that have already been mentioned by my colleague Chura Constantinescu this morning uh, on the hydrogen strategy for a climate neutral Europe. This hydrogen strategy is, uh, has a long term and holistic vision. It is uh, anchored in the green recovery. And it is not a standalone uh, strategy, it is part of a package where we have, uh, apart from the hydrogen strategy, a strategy on energy system integration but also on offshore renewables, wind and solar, to help us produce the hydrogen that we need. And we established the Clean Hydrogen Alliance, as mentioned already earlier. Now, the, the, the priority that we have in this strategy is on the production and deployment of renewable hydrogen uh, through a phased approach. By 2024, we should have uh, six gigawatt of electrolysis installed. And by 2030, that should have grown to 40 gigawatts to produce hydrogen for two main lead markets, as we see them, industrial applications and mobility. Uh, the strategy underlines very much that research and innovation is essential for building up a successful hydrogen economy. Next slide, please. Now we have been supporting hydrogen research for many years already, and we have done that through a so-called public-private partnerships. Uh, and these partnerships uh, are in this case, joint undertakings, the Commission is allowed under the treaty to start joint undertakings with third parties if that helps to increase the efficiency of what we do in, in, in research and innovation. We started the first joint undertaking, uh, the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking in 2008 under the seventh framework program um, for the full duration of the program. And we gave it an EU contribution of 470 million euro to be matched by in-kind and cash contributions from the third parties that are the non-commission participants in the joint undertaking being industry and research organizations. In Horizon 2020, uh, this, the current and last uh, framework program, uh, we started the second phase of this, of the fuel cells and joint and hydrogen joint undertaking with an increased contribution of 665 million euros. And we ended Horizon 2020 with the Green Deal call uh, already mentioned as well, uh, where we had a topic for large scale electrolysis and we put there another 90 million euros. So you see substantial increase in budgets. And for the coming on the, the new uh, research program, Horizon Europe, we, uh, we will soon launch a third phase of this joint undertaking. It will now be called Clean Hydrogen Europe Partnership, more the focus on hydrogen than on fuel cells, with an EU contribution of 1 billion euro, again, to be matched in kind and in cash by the industry and the research partners. Next slide, please. This Clean Hydrogen Europe Partnership will, first of all, of course, contribute to the implementation of the EU hydrogen strategy. Uh, it will strengthen the EU clean hydrogen value chain and accelerate the market entry of innovative solutions that are being developed. Um, we should improve through research and innovation, the cost effectiveness, the reliability, the quantity and the quality of clean hydrogen solutions from the whole value chain from production to distribution, storage and end use. The members in this joint undertaking or this partnership are the Industry Association Hydrogen Europe, the Hydrogen Europe Research Association and the Commission. 
Now, it's important that this partnership will collaborate very closely with other partnerships that we will have on, on the horizon Europe that will use hydrogen in there uh, as, a, as a product. And that's, for instance, the zero emission road transport partnership, zero emission waterborne, Europe's rail partnership, clean aviation, industrial processes for the planet, and the clean steel partnership. They will all use hydrogen and we should have a strong interaction between all these partnerships, of course. Now the hydrogen partnership will continue to develop hydrogen valleys as one of the priorities. We've just seen, next slide please. Uh, already uh, Mr. Urata in the previous uh, presentation already mentioned hydrogen valleys. These are key priorities of what we do in hydrogen uh, research and innovation and deployment. Hydrogen valleys are in principle uh, geographically limited areas, normally uh, sort of ecosystems where you combine production with the end use, keeping the transport issues, therefore uh, the transport as short as possible, avoiding transport issues. We have a number of them in Europe, for example, uh, from left to right, we have them in Scotland on the Orkney Islands, we have them in the north of Netherlands and in Spain, and they produce hydrogen locally from either wind or solar. Uh, to be used for mobility, like uh, ferries or cars and buses, or produce e-kerosene for aviation, use it for uh, heating buildings, houses or buildings, or injecting hydrogen directly in the gas grid. Next slide, please. I should mention, apart from the research and innovation that we do under Horizon Europe, I should mention the Innovation Fund. And this is a particular fund um, it is linked to the emission trading scheme, European emission trading scheme, and the funds come available through the sales of the revenues of 450 million allowances under the emission trading scheme, CO2 allowances, and at the current CO2 price of around 50 euros per tonne, this fund therefore uh, amounts up to 20 billion euros to be invested between now and 2030. And we invest that into energy intensive industries, renewable energy, energy storage, and carbon capture use and storage. Um, important to know that uh, although this comes from the European Nation Trading Scheme, um, uh, not, let's say third countries from outside Europe, including Japan, can participate in a consortium and apply for funding as long as the actions are implemented on the territory of the EU member states. And this is, of course, a very logical uh, caveat. Next slide, please. Here you can see the results from the first call that was launched last year. Um, a total of 311 projects. Two thirds of the projects came from the energy intensive industry. And out of that, a substantial amount, 56 projects on hydrogen. So you see the interest from the hydrogen community in this large innovation fund. I repeat, 20 billion euros, which is a, a fairly large amount. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, coming to international cooperation, this is an interesting, uh, this is of course one of the main issues of the, the conference. Um, our strategy in international cooperation on any field, but in any field of energy, clean energy, is that we do that through multilateral collaboration, um, more and more. Uh, and in hydrogen in particular, we do it through what is called mission innovation. Um, Mission Innovation is a large coalition of, uh, of countries who came together to support investments, increase investments in clean energy. Um, we developed international collaboration on hydrogen through the recently launched Mission on Hydrogen, uh, which was launched in June this year. The goal of this mission on hydrogen is to increase the cost competitiveness of clean hydrogen by reducing the end-to-end -end cost to $2 per kilogram by 2030, which uh, is seen as a tipping point that could unlock or should unlock a global clean hydrogen economy. The mission is further of course to catalyze cost reductions by increasing research and develop development in hydrogen technologies and industrial processes uh, and to deliver at least a hundred of these hydrogen valleys globally covering the whole production storage and end use uh, chain by 2030. The European Commission is co-leading the mission on hydrogen and uh, Japan is an active uh, uh, core coalition member and we look forward to deepen our cooperation with Japan through this mission. Next slide is my last slide, where you can see the coalition. Um, Australia, Chile, the EU, United Kingdom and the United States are co-leading and Japan is an active core coalition member. Um, together, all the members will develop a joint action plan 
to identify national and international efforts to reduce the end-to-end -end cost to this $2 target, to share technological breakthroughs and demonstrations, a lot of knowledge sharing going on, and to develop online information sources, like for instance, the Hydrogen Valley platform under Mission Innovation. With this large, last slide, uh, I thank you for your attention and I give back to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The overall EU situation, what initiatives are taken in Europe has been clearly explained. Thank you very much. Now, the counterpart from Japan's side, representing NEDO, I'd like to invite General Manager of Fioso and Hydrogen Office, Smart Community Energy Systems Department, uh, Mr. Eiji Ohara will talk about NATO and METIS activities. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. I'm all here from NATO. I'd like to talk about NATO's activities. Please move on to the next slide. First, I'd like to give you the update information. As Ms. Hino mentioned in the beginning of this conference, starting this fiscal year, based on Green Innovation Fund, we started our new project. For 2050, to achieve carbon neutrality, we need to accelerate social implementation. So that is the major purpose. Amongst all, how do we reduce hydrogen cost is a major topic. There are two hydrogen models that were established trying to establish core technologies. The first model is for the coastal area, where we would like to use large amounts of hydrogen. Hydrogen should be transported from overseas, and it can be used for various industries and power sectors. Transportation of hydrogen, liquid hydrogen or methyl cyclohexane can be transported maritime uh, by maritime transportation. And hydrogen can also be utilized for thermal power generation. Three billion yen is the budget that is set aside for this project. Next slide. Another project is Power to Gas project, large scale. On site, we can produce hydrogen, and this can be used for multiple processes. Green chemical could be one, thermal uses is another, and large scale hydrogen production equipment can also be established, and also a system. So these are major challenges. We now are uh, investing uh, 70 billion yen for this project. Next. Please go to the next. Next slide. So, <laughs> So, now I'd like to talk about our international collaboration. First of all, information exchange. NATO participates in various international frameworks and platforms. Mission Innovation is one, Hydrogen Energy ministerial meeting. And IEA, in all of these frameworks, we are participating in international discussions to try to identify issues that need to be worked on on the international scale. Respectively, we are working with other individual organizations. NOW in Germany, for example, we wrote the agreement 10 years ago for information exchange. Specifically, we organized workshops to identify the challenges that we need to work on. In the areas of basic research, 
There are several collaboration projects, for example, hydrogen production equipment, water electrolysis, evaluation. That is one research topic. And hydrogen refueling, new protocols are now being developed. And we are working with the United States to promote basic research for those protocols and about hydrogen usage. Uh, we uh, carry out surveys, studies on utilization of hydrogen, as you can see, for example, in Los Angeles, there is electrification going on, and we are trying to encourage the use of fuel source, and we carry out the survey there. The general is not just hydrogen, we are promoting international joint research in various other areas as well, that is to demonstrate Japanese technologies overseas, we are supporting that demonstration efforts, especially the companies that want to go abroad, we are supporting those Japanese companies to move ahead into overseas market. And there are several steps that you need to go through up to the demonstration. For example, there will be general survey evaluation to find out the possibility of deploying hydrogen. So that will be preliminary survey. We can locate specific areas. We can identify specific technologies. We can try to foresee the possible future costs. So that will be a phase of feasibility study. This then will be followed by demonstration. Next slide. This is about international cooperation. NEDO and host countries, we will write the MOU. And respectively, in each country, we provide support to the industry players. So this is the bilateral funding scheme. So this is the general scheme that is often used for international cooperation. In the 1990s, we have started this project. So this is the model. For example, まあ、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
that has been presented before the summer break. Um, so this FIT 455 package is the biggest change to legislation since uh, the um, uh, establishment of the internal market with lots of rules bringing all European countries together. Now again, we have 3,000 pages um, of uh, laws and uh, 1,000 times hydrogen has been mentioned. So it shows that from um, basically a niche technology, hydrogen has become the cornerstone of this uh, transition uh, to a sustainable economy. Next slide, please. I would like to show you some elements that have been proposed by the European Commission. And I think uh, Tudor Constantinescu already alluded to some elements um, basically, but some figures are important. And the important thing is that we might not as Europeans with our industry be good enough to reach these targets alone. This is an invitation to our Japanese partners to contribute with technology uh, to these targets. So what do I mean? Take the target down right. This is that 50%, so half of all hydrogen that is used today in industrial applications, like in refinery, like in fertilizer or in steel production, needs to be renewably produced until 2030. That's huge. We have heard already from some member states uh, that they think this is too ambitious and uh, they think uh, uh, <laughs> we, we might try uh, to change this target. We like this as Hydrogen Europe, as industry, we like this target because we think we can ramp up the renewable hydrogen industry in order to get there. But also 2.6%, you see this on the left-hand side, of all fuels for transport need to belong to the group of the renewable fuels of non-biological origin, with, which is hydrogen and its derivatives. So clear targets, next slide, shows also that um, the CO2 standards for cars and vans have been adapted for hydrogen. The good news is that uh, this favors also passenger cars and vans from, uh, uh, yeah, from the hydrogen sector. The bad news for Europeans is that there are still very few European OEMs being active in that sector, whereas there are Japanese, especially Toyota, but also uh, Honda to a certain extent, being active there. So here it's a clear go for Japanese products in the European market. Uh, also, the alternative fuel infrastructure regulation, which gives obligatory targets, says, and you can see that here, one refueling station will be available every 150 kilometers all over the European um, 10T grid. This is big. This is a very um, ambitious, uh, and I think we will get there. But this gives also, especially for heavy duty, the possibility to fuel hydrogen all over Europe and also in every urban node. Next slide shows that we have also clear targets for aviation. Uh, I'm not going through all the targets, but you can see that it starts already in 2025, both in aviation and in maritime applications. Uh, and it really grows uh, until basically nearly 100% in 2050, where the, the current kerosene and the current um, diesel mainly for, uh, for uh, maritime and kerosene for aviation needs to be replaced by renewably produced or completely decarbonized fuels based on hydrogen and its derivatives. Next slide, please. We now need to put this into practice. We got the hydrogen strategy that has been mentioned several times today. After a year, we got these laws, these legislative proposals that need to be put into practice now. But at the same time, we need to push forward uh, basically the projects. That's what we do by promoting so-called lighthouse projects as catalysts. Um, we see now these days that all the member states have um, produced lists of projects for the so-called IPCEI, the important projects of common European interest. This is a tool uh, to uh, waive state aid rules uh, for these projects, basically to have more subsidies, also state aid for these. Uh, and what we do is we select specially four big projects 
uh, which give room for a lot of partners and a lot of Japanese partners within these projects to accelerate this implementation um, uh, because we cannot wait for um, huge and awkward bureaucratic processes as the financial markets are looking at this. Next slide, please. So there are some benefits uh, and we would like to invite also Japanese companies uh, to uh, have a look at this. By the way, my association has already uh, uh, more than uh, 15 Japanese uh, companies. So uh, we, we are, uh, and we are strengthening the Japanese pillar within our association. We regard this as a very important point. But what we will do via the Lighthouse Projects as Hydrogen Europe, as an industry association, is um, to give priority support, especially technically, but also to have a project maturity assessment, to create visibility, to make a bankability assessment, and also to get investors' money into these projects. Next slide, please. Now, you can see already that some of the EU countries are quite active here. The darker the country, the more projects have been announced and have been already uh, published or already announced to the European Commission, especially uh, with uh, uh, the electrolyzer technology. So here you see uh, all countries are active, the darker ones are extremely active. Next slide, please. Um, what you see in this slide is the two purple lines, and they reflect the targets of the Euro hydrogen strategy of Europe. The first line down there is the six gigawatt that we want to achieve until 2024. To be honest, and you can see that, it might be difficult uh, to achieve with a project announced already the six gigawatt in 24. The other target is 40 gigawatts in 2030. And if you look and compare, you will see we will be overshooting by far the 40 gigawatt with the announced uh, projects. Um, and this is a, a good sign. This shows that uh, the expectation is quite high. Next slide, please. We see three phases uh, to get the implementation done. The first phase is right now. It's the kickstart phase. Um, that started and uh, lasts until 25, uh, where we will see investment, especially state investment uh, into uh, the infrastructure, that's the blue field here, and also market stimulation, that's the green field. As of 25 to 35, uh, it's the ramp up phase. It's the phase where the hydrogen back backbone uh, based on natural gas uh, pipes uh, will be strengthened and intensified, but also, we will see a stimulation of production and demand. I will explain how we want to do it uh, uh, based on the guarantees of origin. After 20, after 35, sorry, we will see basically hydrogen as a commodity uh, and uh, the infrastructure will cover large parts of the natural gas infrastructure that has been repurposed for pure hydrogen. Next slide, please. The guarantees of origin. And here we would like invite Japanese partners um, will be one key element of ramping this up. So we need hydrogen as a distinct energy carrier. And this means that there should be a separate uh, uh, guarantee of origin, also separate from electricity and gas. Um, and these guarantees of origin will and should include inter alia the primary energy sources and the GHG footprint. They should be five Ts trackable, traceable, tradable, transparent, and trustworthy. Uh, and we need to do this all together. Uh, an international guarantee of origin uh, system is required. And we might, as Europeans, come up with some first elements here, but we need the international cooperation. Next slide, please. In order to stimulate the demand and uh, the, the, the consumption of hydrogen to overcome also the chicken and egg dilemma, what we want to do is to establish something like a switchboard. On one hand, it will be auctions, global auctions, that help to define which volume of renewably produced or clean hydrogen will be needed for a steel company, for a fertilizer company, or for the big projects that I mentioned. And that will be done by auctions. At the same time, there still will be a delta of more costs uh, you have with hydrogen for some years than you would have with fossil sources. These costs can be covered by contracts for difference 
or contracts for carbon difference. And the switchboard that we want to build up should combine both the auctioning on a global scale and basically the state aid giving to bring down the cost via the contract for difference. Um, this is, it will be a quite powerful tool. Next slide, please. However, there are some myths around the globe with regards also to battery and to hydrogen. Here, I would just like to invite our Japanese friends to share a little bit also our concern on critical raw material, because we can see that especially China puts a lot of impetus on battery cars, also with a lot of impact on European OEMs, who of course need the Chinese market. Uh, give you an example, Volkswagen has a turnover of 48% in China. So of course they will sing a Chinese song, but this is here a chart that shows you that we need also to take into account and to respect some limitations with the, uh, with the uh, critical raw material. What you see here is the comparison of hydrogen and electrification. And we did some clear um, uh, calculations here. Uh, if we would just take the 40 gigawatts that we want to implement uh, and we will overshoot as I showed uh, in 2030, this 40 gigawatt would power 36 million fuel cell cars. For 36 million battery cars, you require only 29 gigawatts. So yes, it is more efficient when it comes to uh, the, the direct use of the electricity. However, if you see at the raw material, uh, you need much more raw material for battery because um, you have batteries uh, simply uh, need much more. And for the refueling stations or the recharging points, it's also a big ratio or a, a ratio that shows much more critical raw material for battery. If you compare, you will need in the end 70 times less critical raw material if you go for hydrogen rather than battery. This is something that I think Europeans and Japanese should say clearly together because I think we have a joint interest here. Next slide shows that also the circularity, so the recyclability uh, of fuel cells uh, speaks a clear language. If you see that the platinum group minerals reach already more than 60% uh, of recyclability, um, and if you compare this with lithium, this is absolutely clear that uh, here the circularity of the hydrogen production is much, much bigger. These are elements we need to discuss. Next slide shows that there is also a myth with regards to the, uh, to the efficiency, because with the same panel that you see here, one kilowatt panel, you get much, much more um, electricity in some geographies compared to others. We always were thinking that uh, one panel would produce what it produced in Japan or similarly in, in Germany, uh, 1,051 kilowatt hours. But you would get in Northern Africa or in Southern Spain, 2,190. Next slide shows that even if you deduct um, all the efficiency losses, and even if you deduct the costs for transport, in the end, you will get with the same solar panel, 613 kilowatt hours that you can use for a fuel cell compared to, to roughly 600 that you can use for a battery that needs to take the electricity produced in Japan or produced in Germany. So you see this idea of efficiency comparison has some limits and we want to debunk these myths. And I think that's an excellent Japanese European story. Next slide shows that uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and I would like to intensify this strong cooperation. Thanks very much for having me here. Thank you very much. So the final presentation of this session uh, from Japan, from Japan Hydrogen Association, Mr. Seiji Maeda, who is concurrently uh, representing ADEOS. 
Uh, he is speaking on behalf of uh, Japan Hydrogen Association rather than as uh, representing Enos. Uh, thank you, Professor Sasaki. So I'm representing Japan Hydrogen Association. So this is known as JH2A. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I, uh, my affiliation with the NLS, JH2A is a private uh, sector association looking at the supply chain and try to implement a social innovation, uh, the implementation project. It was established uh, to uh, last uh, December. So this is a, uh, association founded last year. So I'd like to introduce the outline of Japan Hydrogen Association and uh, share our ideas concerning the international cooperation. This is the backdrop how we have been organized uh, around the world over. There is a strong interest in the projects surrounding hydrogen and there's diverse developments in Europe. We are paying close attention to whatever is going on in Europe. Last October, there was a declaration by the Japanese authorities for the carbon neutrality and green growth strategy uh, has been uh, declared and the hydrogen and there has been the uh, fund, a social fund that was earmarked to promote the hydrogen energy. In order to accelerate the social implementation of hydrogen energy, there are three uh, challenges. We have to create the demand for the hydrogen. We need to reduce the cost by technical innovation. The third aspect is the fund uh, provision. This has to be simultaneously solved. All those issues needs to be simultaneously resolved. Uh, therefore, we have established intersector association to need, uh, that is needed to solve all these hurdles. 226 companies are members of this organization in the petroleum, gas, uh, power, utilities, electricity, uh, construction, financial institutions, and uh, resources, explore, exploratory uh, organizations. There's a great expectations and interest concerning hydrogen energy. That is the reason why such a broad ranging representation of the membership. This is the organization. There is a general assembly and executive board. There's a planning and the operational committee. Uh, we have working groups dynamically organized in specific areas. There are five working groups in total reporting to the uh, planning and operation uh, council's activities is to propose and coordinate the implement implementation project, creating funds and demand creation and deregulation advocacy, international cooperation and uh, intelligence, gathering information domestically as well as uh, globally. We have working groups and here is the outline of the working groups. I'm responsible for the commercialization regulatory affairs uh, to uh, propose policies for the implementation regulations and uh, we propose roadmaps. External relations, this is uh, closer to the international collaboration, trying to establish liaison with the uh, similar organization abroad and establishing interactions and uh, enhancing uh, the collaboration with the Hydrogen Council and CO2-free hydrogen working group. Definition of CO2-free hydrogen and uh, certification scheme to be established for the CO2. So this is a young organization established in uh, December uh, last year. So the international uh, collaboration, we have just begun uh, this November. Uh, we will be having liaison meetings with Australian or New Zealand uh, counterparts. So supply chain and uh, other areas, we'd like to establish international collaboration interaction. So we need to have a dialogue. We'd like to, and quite interested, establish a forum of dialogue with European counterparts as well. Social implementation projects, there are three patterns uh, here in Japan that is perceived. There is local production, local consumption, renewable energies are produced in certain regions in close collaboration with the local governments here in Japan. The second type is the supply chain, such as renewable energy overseas, the production of the hydrogen overseas and the export back to Japan. And thirdly, is the demand expansion. 
power generation is the area with where the a great demand of for the power generation uh, for the hydrogen is anticipated. So we'd like to uh, organize and plan for the projects across uh, those areas. This year for the social implementation project, we are organized the roadmaps. We are defining the roadmaps such as the social implementation. Uh, we need to visualize the needs and, and uh, we need to uh, foster the moves in the society the, by creating this roadmap. Uh, we would like to improve the mutual understanding across the memberships of this association and also communicating with the local government as well as the central government and leading to new projects. Uh, there are two points associated with the roadmap. Uh, demand uh, for uh, the hydrogen here in Japan. We need to assess how much quantity uh, is, uh, there is demand. So we need to have the assessment of uh, quantity here in Japan. And secondly, establishing a scenario for the deploying uh, the hydrogen uh, utilization. There was 11 uh, clean energy hydrogen uh, projects are confirmed. And the plans for those hydrogen related projects and roadmaps. Uh, so those are the areas that we need to incorporate into our activities. On 4th of October, uh, that will be the date of the hydrogen ministerial meeting. So we are going to submit a roadmap and this will be the summarized version. At the beginning of 2022, we'll be announcing the detailed roadmap, supply chain and demand creation scenarios such as local production and local consumption. Uh, the theme for this session, that is the international cooperation new technology introductions for the supply chain. So that could be the international demonstration or the electrolyzers or the standardization or the development of the uh, standards or certification and the trading systems, international trading systems of the hydrogen, international harmonization and cooperation will be required. So in, together with the demand creation scenario, we would like to organize our thoughts concerning international or cooperation. So we'd like to pursue further communication with the overseas counterparts. Uh, thank you. That concludes uh, the uh, presentation by Hi Japan Hydrogen Association. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So with that, we have completed the presentations representing private companies. In terms of English translation, language selection, there may have been trouble. We are sorry about the inconvenience that's caused. Now, the panel discussion, we have four minutes, but we like to have a discussion, maybe extend time for about 10 minutes or so, especially those who participate in this session. Please turn on your camera and do participate in the discussion. Since the time is limited, what I would like us to discuss, I just want to give you one topic and then invite each one of you to make a small brief comment on this. Once again, as I listened to your presentation, about EU and Japan, respectively in the area of hydrogen energy, there has been steady progress made. Unique projects were carried out. And I do show my respect to your efforts. So we have come to this end and we talked about carbon neutrality and climate neutrality. That's the direction society is moving toward and hydrogen plays an important role in order to accelerate this change. In Europe and Japan, how can we collaborate so that we can accelerate and expand their effort for carbon neutrality and climate neutrality 
expand that effort to a global size. So once again, I'd like to go around the panel. Each one of you can give us a brief comment in the order of the presentation. So, firstly, Anuma-san, please. Yes, EU Japan hydrogen related cooperation. How can we accelerate this? Already, we have developed a vessel. We are designing applications and we have designed teams both in Japan and Europe. Both teams work together to develop one same product and components such as valve and hydrogen tanks and containers. The certifications are different, commonality is limited, and it takes us a long time to design. So it's a particle level, which we would like to see some improvement to make it easy for us to go ahead with the design. And I think the overall project can also be accelerated. Thank you very much for valuable points. Mr. Maeda talked about standardization. And it's not just your company. I think all the other companies are having difficulty because of the lack of standardization. Thank you very much. So now, Mr. Urata, you have rich experience in Europe. You can cite your specific experience. Thank you, uh, Rata speaking. I made a presentation today, as I said, our company is using hydrogen to generate power. So we are the consumer of the hydrogen. To realize hydrogen society, naturally, not just consumers of hydrogen need to be involved. As I said at the end of my presentation, this concept of hydrogen valley is quite important and useful. And we have strong technologies and European presentation we heard. I learned there are many advanced projects and efforts in terms of the hydrogen valley. We can work together there to realize hydrogen valley. And I think it's a very practical and meaningful area of cooperation. I think we can start with technical verification, but not just ending there. We want to commercialize that, overcoming uh, government regulation so that we can complete the whole end-to-end -end business package. If this is possible, then we can deploy that solution to the world, to the global market. So that is one area of possible collaboration. Thank you very much for your opinion. Next, uh, Mr. Schuppers. Uh, so from your perspective, I know that to make uh, the uh, efforts in Japan and Europe uh, tighter, what do you think uh, uh, some of the ideas, please. Well, I think uh, we've heard a lot of uh, input that makes a lot of sense. I think the acceleration to a global transition uh, or clean energy global transition means or translates into global cooperation. And this is what we do. This is why I underline so much the multilateral cooperation that we do. In terms of uh, research and innovation, I think there are two main issues where we can collaborate. First of all, is to have uh, strengthen our cooperation on pre-competitive issues uh, that look into, for example, issues like sustainability and circularity and life cycle analysis. And this is an important point because that can lead us uh, to common technical and safety standards and sustainability criteria and certification schemes, not just for clean hydrogen, but also for the associated commodities, like for example, clean steel, as mentioned by the, by the Tyson Group presentation. 
The second point is to collaborate on sharing knowledge and best practices. And I here would like to voice what Mr. Urata-san just said on the Harajan Valleys. I think uh, we uh, strongly encourage cooperation on knowledge sharing on hydrogen valleys through uh, the, the clean hydrogen mission and the mission innovation where where both japan and the, the eu are actively participating so this is for us an, a key element and third but that's not linked to research innovation i think as also mentioned by mr urata san is that we strengthen our exchanges on on policy and regulatory frameworks that will enable this global cost effective transition to a, a clean energy system thank you So uh, next, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Ohira with NEDO, please. Right, uh, there may be a lot of uh, challenges, but I would like to uh, talk about it uh, from a different perspective. Sustainability and also long-term efforts are needed. Of course, uh, uh, we have to look at what we have in front of us, but uh, we have to look take a perspective of 40, 50, or 60 years. Who are the, uh, the, the uh, uh, players uh, who can uh, implement this uh, practicality? Uh, those, and also we have to develop uh, human resources that are in, well, uh, involved in this uh, well, uh, field. I think this may be a big, important challenge we, everyone uh, in the world, have to tackle. So we have to show what we are doing and uh, convey our message. And uh, we'd like to bring uh, uh, the uh, young people uh, to be interested in uh, this field. I think this is a common challenge uh, that uh, we can cooperate over. Thank you very much. This is indeed what uh, uh, university professor wanted to say. Thank you very much for uh, giving us that uh, comment. Uh, I'm very grateful. Next, uh, uh, from uh, Hydrogen Europe, uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Chatsi Marukakis. So in order to strengthen uh, cooperation between Japan and EU, what uh, do you think are necessary? Well, uh, we heard a lot about standards and I think uh, we have uh, shown over the last years that standardization is always an issue, but not a problem. Uh, we have achieved joint uh, standards, take the 700 bar standard for, for a passenger car, uh, and that went quite good and quite fast. I think this is on a good way. What now needs to be done is the implementation of bigger projects. If we want really to upscale the smaller projects that we did in research and development to basically to show that it's possible, now need to be brought on a bigger scale. I have shown you in my presentation that this is exactly the scope of the next steps, uh, not only of the European Union, I'm, I'm super happy uh, of uh, Tudor's, but also Jeroen's presentation here, um, but it, it, it's also the industry that is uh, behind that. And again, let's strengthen also the Japanese pillar within the European Hydrogen Association. And of course, I would like to uh, uh, cooperate also stronger with my colleague from the young uh, Japanese uh, Hydrogen Association. So there is no doubt that we need to do it. But for what purpose? I think um, Yehun mentioned two words, uh, sustainability, circularity. This is very, very important uh, with regards to the upcoming COP, the big uh, climate conference that we will see in the UK, uh, I think uh, end of the year in uh, October, November, it is the place where the whole world discusses which technology can help fast to accelerate the pace to reduce uh, the, the climate uh, emissions. So, and here I think Japan and Europe have a joint interest. I can tell you that the US that was not interested in the past uh, under, under, under Trump, now with Joe Biden has definitely changed the view on that. Uh, so the US is definitely in, but the partnership between Japanese and European companies is so strong and is um, in the hydrogen field so elaborated that this is a good basis also to formulate joint global goals. One of the goals I mentioned, it's the, stand, it's, it's the uh, guarantees of origin of hydrogen. Let's work together on this global standard uh, as uh, 
Japan, Japan and EU all together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Over to you, Maeda san, representing Japan Hydrogen Association. So, as was uh, indicated by the previous speaker, I'm completely in a agreement. So there should be the dialogue, uh, interaction in between the uh, the councils or the uh, organizations across continents. So the scaling up is important in order to reduce the cost and commercialization, the value chain. So we need to scale up uh, to uh, commercialize. Here in Japan, renewable energy resources in our country uh, there's a restriction here in Japan for us to be able to utilize renewable energy resources. So the hydrogen to be made in overseas uh, cost competitive renewable energy resources that can produce hydrogen that should be brought over. So the, it was important for us to pursue the international collaborative demonstration. It's unfortunate that physically we are so far apart between Japan and the Europe. So the direct supply chain establishment between Japan and Europe will be difficult. However, sharing of the outcome of the demonstration or the mutual the uh, the uh, demonstration collaborative demonstration can take place very quickly so through such a collaborative demonstration we need to strengthen the relationship that is all from amaida san of uh, uh, japan hydrogen association thank you very much so we have common thoughts, common aspirations, especially the last two presentations of those uh, last two presentations during the session served as the summary of the entire uh, the uh, the session. So I don't have the uh, the room for to to reorganize the summary of this uh, session. And thank you very much for contributing your comments and questions through the chat line. We didn't have time to go through all of the contributions to share. Uh, the comments that was uh, contributed to the chat line. I didn't have time to orally refer to those, uh, uh, the comments that was uh, contributed, but uh, into the future, we'd like to have a deeper, deepen our communication interactions. We have four uh, minutes left, so we'd like to move over uh, to the concluding remark and the closing address. So, Initially, we are thinking about five minutes each of the concluding remark, but just one word or just a very you know, short speech for the concluding remark, then we will be able to finish up, uh, on time. So uh, on behalf of the EU, uh, Mr. Konstantinesk, uh, what do you make of uh, what we discussed today uh, for conclusion? I'll give you one or two minutes, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kazunai. I'm, um, I'm pleased that I could uh, open and now close this event today. It, is, uh, it was really very interesting. I also learned a lot of things from Japan and I'm very happy to see the enthusiasm of all participants of collaborating also together. And there are so many potential areas of synergies of complementarities and of mutual benefits for this collaboration between uh, between EU and Japan in the field of hydrogen. So many, many thanks to all the, the players. We had very interesting presentation. We heard about the projects taking place related to hydrogen turbines, low investments and high flexibility, hydrogen in, in the steel industry, the road transport, both heavy duty vehicles and light uh, heavy duty vehicles, the maritime sector's applications, the fuels, the synthetic fuels, which can be used also for aviation, also the progress on, on aviation. All these things were extremely interesting and many projects already happening. We also discussed priorities on international cooperation in multilateral forums, and I very much welcome this. And we do this in the Clean Energy Ministry. We do this in the Mission Innovation through the hydrogen valleys, which were launched also with the support of the joint undertaking with a partner for, for NEDO and which we support to, to strengthen the cooperation based on reciprocity in, in, in the future as well. I, I think we, we gain a lot of uh, significant insights on, on all these sectors for the future cooperation and I'm looking forward to the third EU Japan seminar which will be about uh, certification uh, again, how gas emission calculation, which will be very important for establishing these international, uh, these international markets. 
and also to the hydrogen ministerial uh, conference. And I can assure that on our side, our commissioner, Harry Simpson, is very uh, dedicated also to hydrogen, but also to the cooperation with Japan on hydrogen and very interested in, in this ministerial, but also in further developing and creating this framework of uh, cooperation with, uh, with Japan. I would like to thank you personally, uh, Professor Sasaki Kazunari, for, for sharing this, uh, moderating the whole discussions and panels, but also to the U Japan Center for organizing and supporting us in organizing this event together with my colleagues from DGNR. And uh, with this, back to you for, uh, and to the other colleagues for concluding the seminar. Thank you and uh, looking forward to our next uh, event. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, Ms. Hino, please. Thank you, all the presenters and Professor Sasaki. It's been quite dense seminar. Early on, I forgot to mention something important. I mentioned the 2 trillion yen fund in this project. It will be 370 billion yen has already been invested. European companies are actually part of this project. It's symbolic and it's quite meaningful. So EU Japan working together, working on a common task. We would like to find the breakthrough through this collaboration. And EU and Japan are now leading hydrogen society in the world. We need to build a society where hydrogen is effectively consumed. We need to promote this transition together. So from that perspective, we hope to see more collaboration between them. Hand in hand, we want to accelerate so that we can pave the way forward. Thank you very much today. Thank you. Now, uh, well, I am supposed to summarize uh, the seminar, but uh, I would like to just make some comments first. Uh, from uh, carbon neutrality to uh, climate uh, neutrality, I think uh, we uh, cover the broad range of subjects. And uh, now today, both uh, EU and uh, Japan, the private sector companies, uh, they are now proceeding with uh, uh, commercialization steadily. And also the government uh, has come up with uh, policies and also industrial organizations are talking about uh, uh, international uh, collaboration that's happening. And uh, we now have a uh, renewed knowledge and also EU and uh, Japan can lead in this field. And uh, that is something that I feel very confident about. And uh, there are some other comments I would like to make. And that is, I uh, was in Europe, I lived there and uh, different countries in Europe uh, have different opinions. It's very difficult to coordinate them. Uh, so, but uh, the, there are diverse opinions and but uh, bringing them to into a consensus uh, and uh, turn them into rules. I think uh, that is uh, what uh, European friends are very good at. And so here, uh, Japan is not a member of the EU, but uh, in the field of uh, uh, hydrogen, Japan has had a lot of uh, experiences. Since the beginning of uh, NEDO for decades, we have had successes, we have had failures. And so in the EU's uh, rulemaking, perhaps uh, Japan uh, uh, can air its uh, uh, various uh, uh, experiences uh, so that uh, maybe jointly uh, we can make a rules for the uh, entire globe. That's point one. And point two, as was discussed today, hydrogen, uh, well, starting with hydrogen, uh, we are moving toward uh, blue and green. We are making steady efforts. And uh, in uh, as we develop uh, more and more technologies, uh, the e um, I, I, with uh, a further advancement of collaboration between the two regions, I think uh, we can uh, steadily move toward transition into uh, blue and green. The third point, uh, the importance of uh, international collaboration is something I felt uh, keenly about. When you uh, build uh, well, uh, ships, uh, because of uh, different uh, certifications, uh, uh, that poses a big challenge. So standardization is important. And uh, uh, so joint uh, establishment of uh, uh, well uh, regulations or uh, standards is something that uh, the two regions can cooperate. And also 
uh, you really cannot uh, different aircraft in different countries. So uh, maybe that is something governments can work on, particularly well uh, in the UK, there's going to be a COP conference. Japan is just one uh, country, but EU has uh, more than 20 countries. So perhaps uh, uh, this uh, uh, topic of uh, uh, hydrogen uh, well, uh, can be promoted uh, uh, by uh, many countries in Europe for uh, uh, further efforts. And also uh, the carbon neutrality by 2025, well, uh, uh, well uh, those people who are now uh, the, in their teens or uh, 20s, they're going to play a more important role. Uh, I studied a lot. Uh, I learned a lot in Europe uh, when, back when I was in Europe. And uh, there are many good aspects of Europe, which I would like Japanese people to learn about more. So we'd like to nurture young uh, people. We'd like to urge uh, many young Europeans to come over to Japan. And we'd like to see more Japanese uh, young people to go to Europe to learn about uh, uh, what sort of efforts are being made in Europe. So I would like to ask uh, our colleagues with the uh, well, EU Japan Center to make more efforts. Uh, well, we are well five minutes uh, behind schedule. I'd like to pass this over to the Secretariat, please. Thank you very much for this very insightful word, Professor. Um, so the EU Japan Center would like to thank all of our speakers today for having this great discussion. Now, of course, we would like to thank you, our great moderator. Uh, so thank you to all for this great presentations. And speaking of presentations, may I remind you that all the recording slides and summary of the workshop will be available very soon on our website. And all of the registrations, the people who registered will be informed by email. So just to give you a bit of background about this event, this workshop was part of a one year series of EU Japan events themed around the transition to a low carbon society which is organized by the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation with the financial support of the European Union. So it is thus a great pleasure for me to invite you to our final, but not least important event of this series. It will take place on the 26th and 27th October and will focus this time on the role of local stakeholders. So it means cities, regions and prefectures and also clusters to accelerate decarbonization. So this time we'll have more than 20 speakers of all over Europe and Japan that will introduce initiatives in sectors such as renewable energy, local transport, housing, or tourism. So registration for this event is now open on our website. You can see, I guess, yes, here. On the, if you scan this QR code, you can access the website for registration. So we are waiting for you and Thank you very much. Thank you again and see you soon.